Hi, I'm Manish Gupta and I'm a hand surgeon at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital here. I'm going to talk to you about some tips and tricks about an intramedullary screw fixation for a metacarpal neck fracture. Now this is not designed to be a comprehensive step-by-step -step guide for which I would advise you to go to our web orthoorical web page. This is just some tips and tricks that I've picked up along the way and that works best in my hands. So the metacarpal neck fractures, as you know, is a very common injury and it happens following a blunt impact to a closed fist, commonly a punching injury, the small finger being the most common one. Now, in these fractures, the usual displacement is a forward flexion of the distal fragment. A lot of these fractures can be treated very rightly conservatively with just strapping and an early return to function. However, there are certain indications where a surgeon's interference is required. These are when the fractures are very displaced, when it is an open injury, and most importantly, when the fracture is rotated. A rotation of the fracture will cause scissoring of the fingers, which will, cause, which will be functionally disabling. So my indication of fixing these fractures is the same open fractures, displaced fractures, and rotated fractures. Now we know that they have been fixed by various other means like quick wires or plates and screws, but both of these methods have their problems, especially those of tendon adhesions and stiffness. Using an intramedullary screw is a much more elegant way of fixing these fractures, avoiding all these complications. We published our initial results of 30 such fractures in the Journal of Hand Surgery and we were pleased to report that all of them returned early to work and had a total active movement of more than 265 degrees at the end of treatment. So what are the tips that I have gained over this time in fixing these fractures with this method? The first thing is the incision. The incision is centered at the metacarpophalangeal joint. It's about two centimeters long. So it always extends a lot more distally than you would imagine. Not taking it distally enough can cause problems in inserting the K wire and putting the screw in. And that is an important tip. Exposing the fracture is not required, but you have to expose the MCP joint and a straight longitudinal incision through the skin, the extensor hood, as well as the capsule is what is recommended. I do not try to make transverse incisions in the capsule because that can then produce contractures. So a longitudinal incision in the capsule is an important tip here. The next tip actually arises with the reduction of the fracture. Now, as we know that the fracture is reduced with a jaws maneuver that brings the forward flexed distal fragment back into line. The, an important tip here is to clench the fist once the fracture has been reduced. That allows the rest of the fingers to prevent any malrotation of your broken digit. I have found that this flexing of the fingers to make a fist is very useful in maintaining the reduction once it is obtained. A very important tip here. Once the K wire has been inserted or the guide wire has been inserted down the medullary canal, it is important to take an image intensifier picture to make sure that number one, your fracture is well reduced and secondly, that the wire is placed centrally in the canal. Trying to rush through without taking this image intensifier picture is bound to cause problems later on. My next tip on this procedure is the reaming over the, over the guide wire. Now there is a tendency we all have in under reaming or not reaming for a, enough appropriate length. So a tip here is to make sure that you ream right up to the tip of the guide wire. It is important to ream across the isthmus. The last thing we want is for this hollow intramedullary screw to get stuck in the isthmus because then when you try and tighten the screw through the tight canal, you are bound to cause a problem 
with the head of the screw. Having done that and been there, I would not recommend it. Once this reaming has been done, comes the next important trip. This step is when you're putting the screw in. Sounds easy enough, but remember that the head of the screw is bigger than the tip of the screw. And as the head engages into the head of the metacarpus, there you are likely to produce enough torque to reproduce a malrotation deformity. Maintaining rotational alignment during the final tightening of the screw is extremely important and crucial for this procedure to succeed. Once everything has been done, checking the rotational alignment, making sure that the reduction is appropriate and the screw length is big enough will ensure that you have not caused and not missed any problems along the way. A next tip which I have found very useful and I have learned over, that period, over a period of time is during closure. I do not routinely now close the capsule at all. I allow the edges to fall in place and just close the extensor hood. In my mind, this prevents or reduces the risk of capsular contracture, which is a common cause of stiffness afterwards. Once entire closure has been achieved, comes the final tip, and that is rehabilitation. Early mobilization in these fractures is absolutely crucial for an optimal outcome. Mobilize them early. It is never too early to start mobilizing them. Full mobilization, both active and passive, specially concentrating and the flexion of the MCP joint is what is going to give us the best results. I hope these tips will allow you to tackle these injuries with this surgical technique.